Okay, so I'm gonna actually uh, speed up a little bit uh, in this in this here because it, this is just different realizations. Actually, this is contrary to the other one that I showed you, just one single shot experiment. These experiments are very very expensive. And the reason is because actually all of this was done on hardware. Actually, every single iteration of the quantum, of the, of the, of the machine learning pipeline is actually was calls to the hardware to take the next step, take hardware measurements, update the function. So this is actually the real thing. Actually, this the other one was theoretically just taking a single shot. Here is actually is all these experiments on, on the ion trap. And not only this, but actually we compare different sol we compare different solvers. So remember I told you that you can use these black box solvers. So here. We use PSO, that that's a ba very basic one. And this one actually is coming from a, from a really great one that actually is a commercial solver. It's a, using Bayesian optimization. That's a different solver. And that, of course, the power of the solver is just to make life easier for the experimentalists because they need to do less experiments. So they, you can learn in less iterations. So that's very important for them. And this is what you see here. This is actually, I'm showing you the, 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 the results that you get for all to all connectivity with, uh, this is the theory and the experiment, the simulation of the experiment. And what you can see is the result that you get from the experiment. So basically, as I mentioned, with the Barson stripe, in, even in the experiment, you nailed pretty well the six patterns of the Barson stripe with the all to all topology. Everything done directly on hardware. And then here, what you have is, as we knew, if you only use two layers, basically, you. This is the experiment here in blue. So again, you have a poor performance with these two picks. They should not be there. They are not Barson stripe. The performance is poor. And you can see that in the KL. And when you go actually to the four layers, you see again actually that you do a really great job actually reducing, the, reducing those picks. And the KL is comparable actually what you get with the all to all. This is actually the iron trap setting. As I said, one of the flexibilities and the nice things about DDQCL and QCBMs is that if I have a different software, hardware, then I can tune the parameters that I choose for my gates. And here, actually, in the Rigetti device, the way they do entangling gates is usually with Control Z. That um, I think Olivier mentioned yesterday, Control Z. But it's basically is uh, uh, is if you get the if you add zero, basically you apply the identity, so nothing happens on the on the on the control qubit. But if you have, uh, if you are in the state one, the target qubit is the control one. Then basically you apply uh, a sigma c, a c operation. So basically that's an entangling gate that is used widely using cluster states, and that's the power of the. That's actually what is commonly used in these superconducting devices. Then notice my parameters, actually one trick that we did as well is, and again, this was information, our data is classical. The control C gate, when you expand this, it has only real values. We really, I mean, in some way, we can go get, get away without actually having complex numbers because we are not trying to describe the phases in the wave function. So we just care actually about, even if we had only real wave functions, we're fine. So that actually, with that intuition, we reduce the number of parameters to actually just include R, RY rotations. If you look at the matrix, at the unitary matrix for RY, it's only real components. So actually, it's good. So that's actually, we're dealing basically with real wave functions. And what you can see here is that uh, here we, again, oh, this is actually the experiments on the ion trap. This is to highlight, let's say, the good things about superconducting qubits and the hardware is that they're usually much faster. So the turnaround or every experiment in the ion trap is much longer. I mean, the, 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 the lines and everything, the control is much longer. That way you can get in superconducting qubits. And for example, not here, we can do 2,000 experiments with three different solvers, three different setups of classical solvers. And we can do as well many repetitions. In the ion trap, it was just maybe a couple of solvers and then just one line. Basically, it's kind of like cherry picking what was the, the best starting point and just go with that. Here, really, I mean, we can try to, that's why in the paper we call it a robust implementation. Because when you are actually doing this, you cannot cherry pick. You actually you have to do many repetitions and then see statistically what's the performance. In particular, if you assess in design, you cannot just go and report to, you, to your boss telling, this is, the, this, is the, this is the performance just out of one run. All of these methods are stochastic. So basically, you need to run many times and check what's the medium, what's actually the, 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 the variance. 
And this is basically what we are doing here. So we're doing each one of these lines is really five different runs. Each one of those are so 2,000 experiments with three different solvers just to test the capabilities of the solvers and to see actually if there is any significant difference, differences between using different solvers, different, using different hardware topologies, like here, a line topology, versus a start topology on the device. This is actually the connectivity of the Rigetti device. And then, in this particular case, either if you use the start topology or the line topology, the number of parameters is the same. So we're comparing apples to apples, and you can make decisions. In this particular case, actually, it just happened that the line topology is very poor compared to the start topology. And it could be many things. It could be real. Or it could be just that maybe these four qubits behave better than, the, than, the, than these four other four qubits. There could be many explanations, but at least you can even move this window and use this technique actually to assess the performance of different qubits. Like have, have a more robust measurement beyond the single qubit characterization and two qubit. Maybe you can have actually, basically here you're testing as an overall, how are these four qubits behaving? And when you go Barsons try four by two, you have eight qubits, you can test, okay, how is my eight qubit device working here? In this, in this window. So you can use it certainly as a characterization technique. So it was built, let's say, for a machine learning purpose. But as you can see there, we created an easy to calculate metric. It's called the QBAS. In, the, in this NIST community, there is now one that is famous called the quantum volume that it tells you it was created by IBM. It tells you how good your device is as a bulk. So basically, this QBAS is telling you how your device works having in mind this very specific task that is solving. So it's another point, a data point that is, uh, we feel is valuable and it's very easy to, to compute. Uh, I'm just actually gonna skip this for the most part, just to move to the other portion. But basically, this is a more thorough study, just to give you uh, an idea that sometimes fine-tuning this machine learning algorithm is not easy. And basically, there are many options. For example, here are six different black box solvers. The question is, which one should I use for quantum, for quantum ansatz? And basically, what we found, actually, that the CMAES is very robust, actually. That's the one that we like the most when you compare to other solvers, like Adam, CO, PSO, I mentioned in the past. IBM uses this one a lot. Nendermid is famous, but it's very basic. So this one, actually, it was really great in performance, and when we did many repetitions. And also, it looked like actually, as we, as we said, the, the start topology looked like he was really having a, 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 you look actually at the mediums themselves across the solvers. Like it is true actually that the start topology has a little bit per better performance than the, that actually this, the, the, start, the line topology, which is interesting actually. And it's maybe just because of the, the symmetry of the data set. So again, another point that we wanted to, that we highlighted, this actually this paper is not published, but another point that we wanted to highlight, that we highlighted in a robust, is there is usually a significant variance between the different from run to run. So that's why it's important to do many repetitions, and that's something that is usually not done just because it's very expensive, but it should be done. So it's kind of like trying to send the, the, the best practices when you do this type of training. And uh, yeah, so that's basically some of the take home messages. In the last minute, maybe I'll just go quickly over the uh, I promised you guys an, an application, and this is work in progress. I think the paper should be out in a, in a couple of weeks. And it's, okay, Bars and Stripe is beautiful. We're gonna see in the afternoon we're working with digits. But as I said, I mean, my heart has always been, can we have an impact in real world application? Like, what about data coming from the real world? So the closest, the, the closest thing that we could do is actually take data from the stock market and work on a specific application. So there is an application that is called the portfolio optimization. Maybe it's the most famous finance application. Basically, you have a universe of assets. Let's say the, all the five, most important 500 companies in, in, the, in the US or in the world. And then you have a, a million dollars, and you want to invest that. You want to invest into those. Decide which of the 500 companies I want to put my money. And then basically, either there are two scenarios. I either want to have a certain return over one year, I minimize my risk of not losing my money. Or I can say, I, I, I can afford this much risk, and I want to ask the financial advisor, give me what would be my, my expected return. I want to maximize my return. So it's an optimization problem. But we can as well actually turn that problem into a probabilistic setting, when basically we're going to get the quantum device or the classical device to give us, OK, if you want to have the lowest, the lowest risk for an expected return, 
you should invest. I mean, the most likely solution is, is this type of asset. But then there is another the runner up option would be this type of asset. And then probabilistically, you can actually measure. So it's actually, when you, once you put in this probabilistic framework, you can either do it with an RBM, as I mentioned, restrictive pulse machine that we're going to see in detail how to train and what, what this means actually in the afternoon. Or we can do it with our quantum circuit pulse machines. There is a beautiful thing actually that we noticed is it's really hard to compare classical and quantum. So there is a really just a coincidence is that if we count the number of parameters that come out of the all to all connectivity with two layers, only two layers, it is actually exactly the same number of parameters at the number of parameters in an RBM if you had n visible n assets, that would be my visible variables, it would come here. And then if you have half of the hidden units. So if you restrict to that parametrization, where let's say I want to pick 10 assets, then I should, I should always use five hidden units. Then that will give me an equivalent of a circuit with just five, with, with a 10, 10 qubits. So the number of parameters will be one to one. So we can do actually an apples to apples, the best that we can do to an apples to apples comparison without being unfair to the quantum or the classical one. So that's basically what the paper is about. And again, the question here is, let's take real data from the stock market. Let's do sub-universe of the stock market. Let's pick 10 assets. And let's see how well we do in making decisions there. Just based on construct probability distributions out of the market. And let's throw the task to a quantum device. Let's throw the task to a classical device and see which one is doing better. The results actually, because as I told you, nobody knows what is the power of this quantum distribution. So they could be better. Our results actually were quite encouraging and surprising. So this is a very preliminary plot. I mean, we have better plots by now. But I just wanted to give you the gist. So basically, this is the number of qubits that it would be. We tried 4, 6, and 8. We have now in the paper up to 10. And basically, this is the number of assets, small experiments, because we can only simulate up to 16 qubits. So we wanted to keep it small. But we wanted to check the scaling of the power representability of a quantum model with the same number of parameters as a classical model. And what you can see actually is when you compare with the classical machine learning approach, let's say the canonical one that is contrasted divergence, Boltzmann machine, basically you can see actually that the quantum model is beating consistently the, the classical machine learning approach. So this is very encouraging because it looks like actually this quantum circuit with the same number of parameters actually has better representability, is doing a better job than the, quantum, than, the, than the classical model. So that's very neat, I mean, and it's, that's our very first thing that we try with real data, and, and it's working very neatly. So I told you, we have many, many more plots and things in our paper, different quantized things, if you want to look at it. It should come, actually, so it's quantum versus classical models in machine learning. So that's the paper that is coming up uh, soon. Alejandro? Yes. How did you define your target distribution? Yes, so, so as I said, we, take, we really take data from the stock market, from the data of the stock market, since it is small enough, we can, we can actually uh, we can characterize what would be the theoretical distribution from the stock market. And now what we do is we, take, we really do it a la generative model. So we take a handful of data, we sample from that distribution that only we know, and then we give the samples, let's say we give them 100 samples of that distribution, we give them to the classical device and the, to the quantum device. And then when we compare and see which one did better, at generalizing, at actually at capturing the original distribution, because none of one, none, none the classical, the quantum, they didn't know about the original distribution. So basically, they do, they do their job to try to describe the data, and then our performance metric goes back to the original distribution, because now it's kind of like a blind test. Then we go back and we compare to the original distribution. So that's basically what we do. So, so that's the procedure. So that's actually testing. The test is not, in, it's not just including how is it doing with the data, it's actually is, is testing how, is, how good is it at generalizing. Because basically the distribution has more features that are not captured in 100 samples. But then basically when you compare to the top one, you can see which one did a better job at capturing the correlations. So that's basically more or less kind of like the, the story behind the paper. I still have a hard time to understand what, how you know it's the best. You, you take data from financial market at one day and then you compare oh, no, no. with well, five days after and yeah, see no, no. which actually, one was the, way, the actual yeah. so better. So the mathematical model, I mean, I won't need to go into more detail. The mathematical model, basically, what you do is you take the whole time series for, for many years. And actually what they do is 
you calculate the expected return for each one of those ones. You also use the data points in the time series to calculate the variance. That's, cal that's what is called the Markowitz model. With the Markowitz, with the Markowitz model, you take the variance and covariances among the different assets, and then that defines the risk. So in our case, we fixed the return, and we wanted to minimize the risk. And basically, so we took all the data, the Markowitz model, to actually to do that. So it's, it's a little bit more detailed, but certainly, once you do that, the risk becomes kind of like your energy, the equivalent of your energy. And then that's when you build the Boltzmann distributions and you sample from that. So that's basically what we do. Um, so, and here you are comparing the uh, number of, uh, of uh, parameters, right? And how it goes with the number of uh, iterations in the quantum and classical case, like are they similar or? We actually, I don't think, I mean, we, yeah, that, that's a good question. So, let me see, we have that actually. No, we actually, we're, we're not reporting that, but we, yeah, certainly we, we have all of that. So maybe it would be good actually to mention about that. And I don't, I don't remember off the top of my head, actually at some point Vicente, who is the second author, he was mentioning maybe to put a learning curve, but we were focusing actually on the comparison of the performance, but I think it's a, it's a good point. So maybe we'll add something along the lines, yeah. Just to be more explicit about how many iterations it took the, RBM versus the other one. The, the other. It's always hard to compare because I mean they have different resources, a quantum device, maybe it's more expensive, the time is different. So it's true, but yeah, but the iteration could be one thing that we can certainly report. Just to finalize this section, as I mentioned, it's again my brother work playing with math is is one thing actually is uh, uh, one thing is that we were very curious is if you go back to the circuit, I told you that the maximum entanglement happens at 0.5. If you go back here, you can see that the ion trap circuit that we got, there was a lot of maximal entangling gates here. Max, like significant entanglement setting here. So we were curious like, okay, then what's the, what's the, what's the entanglement of this bars and stripe data set? I mean, why, why is it actually, why is it so difficult? For example, the first time that we're trying to regate the device without using some of the sophisticated tricks, it was so noisy that actually we're getting garbage out. So basically, it's, it looks like it's a hard data, a hard way function to prepare, why? And basically, and this actually motivates us why, why it's good for benchmarking. What we realize actually is so you take any wave function that would give you an exact Barson stripe data set. So uh, this is the uh, an universal Barson stripe wave function for four qubits. Basically, you don't care about the faces, but they could be there and they will give you different entanglement. If you take all these wave functions and ask, what's my universe of entanglement that I can get out of this wave function that always give me exactly Barson stripes? So one of the metrics that we use, something actually very interesting is that for four qubits, if you assume the met one metric that is called absolutely maximum entanglement, that is basically taking all possible bipartitions, for three qubits, we know actually that is absolutely maximum entanglement is the GSC state, the cat state. For four qubits, under that definition, there is a theorem that proves that there is no absolutely maximum entanglement in four qubits. When you go actually to five qubits, then you recover absolute maximum entanglement. That's one of the cluster states that Olivier was mentioned yesterday. And six qubits, actually you have it again. And one canonical way of construct constructing this absolutely maximum entanglement states is through cluster states. It was interesting, actually, the paper with the theorem, it shows what's the maximal conjecture entanglement that you can get for four qubits under this metric, basically under any possible bipartition of the four qubits. So you take AB, AC, AD, and basically there are six of them, but the other ones are equivalent, so you only need to compute three of them, and you compute the entanglement of the bipartitions. Actually, what it happens is, I mean, again, my brother was playing with this, so we computed this quantity. It's five parameters. It looks like it's going to be a nightmare. But actually, the beautiful thing is that it just collapses to two parameters that you need to deal with. Actually, the five parameters just come in combinations of two, two parameters. And that's beautiful because actually we can have a 3D plot of that, or the entanglement as a function of the, or the, or the phases on the wave function. And what you can see actually is that the, let's say this would be the real, the, the lowest entanglement that you can get in this plot is already 1.25. That actually that corresponds when you have the, the plain vanilla bars and stripe. Only all of the, all, with, the, with the phases all equal to zero, pretty much. So basically you get plus, 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 the six states. But actually, if you pick interesting phases, like in these two points, you get a, a large entanglement. And guess what, actually, to our surprise, this is exactly matching this, the state, I mean, it's not, it's not the same state, but it's exactly matching the, the, the state 
with the maximal entanglement conjecture for four qubits. So actually you can choose the phases. So the entanglement of any Barsen's type for four qubits is gonna be between 1.25 and 1.79, not that these values. And it's interesting because actually if you compute the entanglement entropy, average entanglement entropy of a GSC state is just one. So actually the higher the better. So what that means is that the, any Barsen stripe state has a significant amount of entanglement and that's the reason why it was hard for the hardware to prepare these states, or at least to show results on, on these states. So this is just, I mean, just to close up that it can be used for benchmarking and, 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 this, uh, and this type of other purposes. So I wanna wrap up, before I move to quantum annealing, I wanna just wrap up this, this part one. And I hope, I mean, I deliver in just telling you, I mean, it was just as, as I mentioned, it's just an exploration in machine learning and what we can do with this, uh, with this type of applications and with near-term devices. I hope, I mean, I under, I, now, by now you know why. I mean, the reason is lot, tons of difficult tasks in machine learning that you could, you could, you could benefit for quantum devices and where we were looking, for example. It could be in the quantum model or it could be actually the advantage could be directly in the training. So that's actually exploding entanglement or exploding tunneling as we're gonna see in quantum, quantum manilin. So this is the why and the where. You, you saw already that it's quite messy to play with this. I mean, in the sense of you need to really be very mindful of the classical optimizer that you use, the cost function, as Rafael mentioned. I mean, it depends what you pick as like a low likelihood, you have divergences, then you can pick moment matching, or you can actually, how you design even your circuit. You need to be mindful about all of that. Hopefully you got a little bit of a gist through my comparison of ion traps and, 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 and uh, superconducting. And this is just, as I said, it's very preliminary work directly on quantum models for a finance application, how it will look like. And it's just, uh, again, it's, it's unpublished work, but I wanted to throw, some, throw you some real data there, at least, what, what it looks like. With that, I finish actually part one, gate base. Now we're gonna actually, the rest of half an hour, we're gonna have fun with uh, Anili before, and we continue with machine learning and annealing in the afternoon. That's good? Any questions? Up to here. The gate base. Oh, sorry, I forgot. I mean, just wanted to acknowledge all my collaborators. Uh, as I said, it was John Realpe, who was a research scientist working in, in my team while I was at NASA. Delfina happened to be my wife, actually. So she was working, she was, it's a long story, but she was for two years without a job because we were doing the permanent residency and then we ended up working in this paper with Marcello. She's a scientist as well, but more like chemical engineer. Yeah, Vicente was actually one of my Qubitera researchers that actually, as part of the acquisition, was transferred to Rigetti and working with me. My brother as well, he was working in Qubitera but then ended up joining Rigetti just part-time as a consultant as well. Nam is IonQ uh, researcher and, and Javier is actually working in the finance application with me. And the team of Chris Monroe, the experimentalists, or the work these beautiful experiments on their side. So I'll actually, just with that, I'll wrap up and switch now to to quantum annealing. All right, so we have about half an hour, as I say, we'll continue in the afternoon the story of quantum annealing and how can you do with a different type of device, how can you still do machine learning type of tasks? So that would be, we we'll continue. But I wanted to devote this half an hour just to combinatorial optimization because there are a lot of machine learning applications that require combinatorial optimization and I wanted just to give you a gist. So let's go now again. As I said, is the main motivation is can we find again real world applications? And as I said, there are lots of real world applications that rely on combinatorial optimization. Bayesian optimization, Bayesian learning the structure of Bayesian networks, protein folding, and full diagnosis. We mentioned a few yesterday. So why is it possible? What we're gonna learn in this half of the like, is this half of the half an hour, is why is it even possible to think that you can use a quantum device to solve optimization problems? And the reason is simple, as I said, any problem, protein folding, learning the structure that is discrete in nature and is optimization, it can be actually mapped to this type of energy function. That is actually is great because in physics we know this, it's, a, it's an ice in a spin glass. But then basically in the computer science they call this an NP-hard problem. So the hardest pro one of the hardest problems in computer science, they are usually called NP-complete problems. Those are the one million dollar questions. They are usually intractable. And any NP-complete problem can be turned into an optimization version 
that is the minimization or the maximization, into an NP-hat problem. And basically, the task here, as I said, is to find the bit strings, or the spins, that actually minimize the cost function. I give you the H's and the J's, and you minimize the function. Notice there is a big difference here between machine learning and combinatorial optimization. It's kind of like a duality. In combinatorial optimization, I'm, I'm asking for the bit strings that minimize, that minimize the problem. In machine learning, at least in the learning piece, I'm asking what are the H's and the J's that describe the model. So actually, you see, it's, it's two different questions. In the prediction stage, you can actually you're, you're, you can ask questions again about the, the variables, but in the learning stage, you're actually asking for the H and J. So now you see actually interesting differences. But let's see actually how you can use, as I said, I take a protein folding problem, and then that will give me an H and J, and I can hand that to a computer scientist, and they will try to minimize this. The first step of understanding why you can do this with a quantum device is a simple observation. It's just, this is my target, bit strain, the one that minimizes. There are two to the n, so it's huge. I mean, it's with a couple of hundred qubits. You have many orders of magnitude atoms in the universe, so this is impossible to do one, go by one, one by one to check if it is the global optima. But let's say that actually this is this one. So it is, it is a simple observation that if you have this cost function, I mean, just because of the properties of the, the poly matrices and that this is just the eigenvalues of this poly matrix in the computational basis is just plus one and minus one. That spins. This is actually pretty much a classical Hamiltonian, but it's already gearing towards a quantum Hamiltonian. So actually, it's, it's still not fully quantum. We're going to see the quantum version. But the cool thing actually is that if you turn this into an eigenstate or a quantum state, basically, which ones are the eigenstates of this Hamiltonian? Since it is fully diagonal, basically, it's precisely all the two to the n possible computational bases states. Out of those, and in the diagonal of this Hamiltonian, you will have actually a global minimum. And actually, if you apply, you can do the homework, you can apply this operator to the ground state that you define like this, for example, a state that actually has this bit string, spin up, spin down, spin up, spin down, for this particular star. And then basically, you will pick up actually that there is a one-to-one -one mapping between this Hamiltonian and that one. So basically, it's the spectrum of this Hamiltonian is identical to the spectrum of this cost function. So I haven't solved the problem. I just make it a little bit familiar for you in the quantum domain up to here. And this is a classical Hamiltonian, so I, have, I haven't described anything about quantum manual. The only thing that you need to do the homework is just do this. Apply this, and you will pick up or that one. And, and this expression, the eigen, eigen energy that comes out, it will come the eigen energy evaluated at this stop. So now, let me give you a little bit of history of uh, quantum annealing. And, and you, you will see, and it, there is still even a debate of what you call adiabatic quantum computation, what you call quantum annealing. But actually, quantum annealing, it was proposed in, I would say, the earliest one that everybody knows is 1994. And it was actually this paper by Finilla et al. that actually is quantum annealing. And it was actually, as we know it now, but it was for continuous potentials. So actually, it was used as a, as a quantum inspired algorithm where you use quantum fluctuations to find the global optimum of, of potential energy surfaces. So actually, you have a potential energy surface, it's complex, and you want multidimensional potential energy surface, and you want to land in the global optimum. And that's basically what quantum annealing was used for. So it's in the realm of continuous variables, potentials with, uh, let's say, like our quadratic potential, like the parabolic potential. It was actually in that domain. But actually, you're using quantum resources. We're going to see how they use the quantum resources. But actually, the very first time actually that it was applied in the, in the context of the spin systems, it was actually by Kadawaki and Nishimori. So that's why Nishimori is, when we go to our quantum annealing conference, Nishimori is kind of like considered the father of quantum annealing, as we know it now. It actually was just in the same framework as this one, but actually just in terms of a spin glass systems, where actually this is a cost function. He was actually in that paper, they were actually in this paper relating to the optimization of cost functions, or combinatorial optimization problems. Because now we know that any combinatorial optimization problem, we can phrase it like this. And the only thing that they added, actually, is just this, what is called the driver Hamiltonian. And of course, if you're using quantum mechanics, you need something that, that doesn't commute with the sigma z. Otherwise, the problem, as I said, is, is trivial, or you're in the classical realm. Here, actually, you have, this is the term in some way, the driver Hamiltonian. 
is the one that is inducing quantum fluctuations. That is allowing for tunneling, that is allowing to for, for all the fun stuff, for superpositions, all of this. Now, when we go, uh, actually, it was in 2001, Farhi et al., they published this paper in Science, that actually, if you look very closely, is exactly the same as this paper in 1998. The only thing is that they published a paper in the archive where we define what is called now adiabatic quantum computation. That is just a bit of an extension of this for, 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 for using the adiabatic theorem of quantum mechanics to do arbitrary computation through ground state, through the computational ground state of Hamiltonians. One example of that is if we find the ground state of this one, then basically we will be solving the combinatorial optimization problem. But if you have a many body interaction system, you can still use an adiabatic quantum computer to do that. So let's say, that's why let's say quantum, when I think of quantum annealing, I'm always thinking of a couple of things. I'm thinking of practical applications, like a quick and dirty approach to solve combinatorial optimization problems. I'm thinking as well, in the framework on Ishimori, actually, it wasn't at finite temperature, actually it was a zero temperature. But usually, as it is understood now, I'm thinking of a device at, 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 a, temp at a temperature of a fridge. So, a divided quantum computation is just really coherent zero temperature computation. So it's basically, it's just, uh, you don't get any temperature, it's just basically you just do computation, and that's completely equivalent to the gate-based model. So that's why a divided quantum computation is very important, just because it's, uh, a, it's equivalent the same way that one-way computing, and many of these paradigms, uh, topological computing, adiabatic is equivalent to gate-based as well. So, this is basically the paper of Farhi, uh, but in reality, it looks like he wasn't aware of the paper, of, uh, or, or at least there is no reference to the paper of Hidetochi uh, back then in, in, in the day. Now, what is actually, what is the magic? That's what we're gonna do in the, in the blackboard for a little while. Let's see if we can swap here.